Today we're going to share with you the carbon outcomes of silvicultural alternatives at the Penobscot Experimental Forest. My co-presenter is Dr. Josh Pulik of the University of Maine, and this is a topic that Josh and I have been working on for quite some time now. It started with the project he did for his PhD dissertation, which was funded by a Northeastern States Research Cooperative grant. The co-PIs on that project included Aaron Weiskettle and Ivan Fernandez of the university, as well as Lindsay Rustad and Randy Kolka from the US Forest Service and other cooperators. So we had a nice team on this project. The Penobscot Experimental Forest was established in 1950. And so now in 2020, that makes this our 70th anniversary. So this is an important year for us. Although originally owned by forest industry, the US Forest Service established a long-term research study here looking at different outcomes of silviculture in the northern conifer forest type. Today, the forest is owned by the University of Maine Foundation and is a collaboration between the Forest Service and the university. The Forest Service has, of the 4,000 acres in the forest, about 1,000 acres in long-term research. This is divided up into management units, each of which is about 20 acres in size, and in the study we're presenting today, there are two replicates of every treatment. We have had continuous measurement and repeated harvest since the study began in the 1950s. So this is a really well-designed study. Before we start talking about the outcomes, I wanna take the minute to review the composition and structure when the study began. We had at that time an average volume of slightly over 2,000 cubic feet per acre. And when we look at basal area, we had 30 square feet per acre in the sapling class and 117 square feet per acre in the poles and saw timber. So here we have the species composition and diameter distribution. And this color scheme is going to be carried throughout my portion of the presentation. We see red and yellow for the hardwoods and blue and green for the softwoods. And in the sapling class, we see that most of the small trees were balsam fir. There was very little eastern hemlock or red spruce, some presence of the other softwoods, other hardwoods, and red maple. However, when we look at the merchantable size classes, and here I had to change the axis so we could see what's going on, you will notice a greater proportion of eastern hemlock and red spruce in the green on the bottom of the graph a lesser amount of balsam fir as tree size increases and some presence of other species in red maple throughout the distribution. Regardless of species, there were very few trees in the medium to large saw timber classes. And so this was an aggrading second growth forest with scattered residuals of larger trees. And this composition and structure are important to keep in mind because they affect the carbon outcomes that we're going to share with you today. So the design of this experiment basically put each stand into one of four categories. So here we have our pre-treatment stand, different species shown by different colors of the crowns and some poor quality or poor form trees you can see here in my really excellent illustration. And we went in three different directions with our management. And this is how they were classified at the time. And we'll talk about this a little bit as we go forward, but three buckets, uneven age silviculture. So that was represented by multiple variants of single tree selection, even age silviculture. So shelter wood in various manifestations. And then what was called exploitive harvesting. So different types of diameter limit cutting and commercial clear cutting. And then finally, no management. So there is a couple of stands that were just set aside and have not had anything done but inventory since 1950. I do wanna mention before we get into the weeds that this particular study was used for the collaboration with Josh, Ivan and others because we had over 65 years of data really well documented. However, there are other silvicultural treatments that are relevant in this forest type and that may be important from a carbon sequestration perspective. They just didn't happen to be in this particular study. So that includes clear cutting, strip cutting, group 
variants of selection or shelterwood and the expanding gap irregular shelterwood, which has been promoted in the region by Bob Seymour. So we do have some data from some of these, but it wasn't for the period of time and in the same study design as what we're talking about today. So what about the stands where we didn't do anything? If we had just not managed since 1950, what would the outcome have been? Well, the top graph shows the distribution over time of saplings in the light gray poles and small saw timber in the medium gray and medium to large saw timber in the dark gray. And what you see, not surprisingly, is an increase in stocking and an increase in the proportion of medium to large saw timber. If we look at that broken out by species, we see that there was a large increase in the amount of basal area in eastern hemlock and also some in other softwoods, so that's eastern white pine. Balsam fir really has been diminished from the stand, and this is what you would expect based on the, um, the pathological longevity of that species and the fact that we've had a spruce budworm outbreak. You can see that there in around year 30 of the study. So that's what would have happened if we hadn't done management. Now one caveat, back in 1950 when they thought to set up a reference, they didn't want to put it in the sites they thought were best for their study, they wanted to stick it over in the part of the forest they weren't using for anything else. Well in this case it turned out to be full of white pine. So many of the other treatments we're looking at today do not have that proportion of white pine. So although the long-term trajectory of volume and the relative species shifts are relevant, that dark blue white pine component is not as prevalent in the silvicultural treatments. All right, so what were those treatments? First, uneven aged or selection system. Here we see the typical sawtooth basal area graph. Over time, multiple entries depending on the cutting cycle, 5, 10, or 20 years. And I think the main point here is that we increase the proportion of saw timber by doing selection cutting. Shelter wood system. So this was even age silviculture. We have a number of different variants where we took the overstory off in two cuts or three cuts over a period of less than 20 years. Also one where pre-commercial thinning was applied. And on the graph on the top, you see a recent commercial thinning shown by the drop in basal area. Here, what we've seen is um, a reduction of the overstory as you would expect through overstory removal, an increase in saplings and pole timber. And in the last 20 years, a shift from sapling stocking to the poles as the trees are recruiting to larger size classes. Now, one of these variants was a two-aged system. So this is a form of irregular shelter wood that's shown in the graph at the top and on the picture that I just brought up. And here they left residuals, primarily hardwoods and fir in the like six to seven or smaller inch class. So there, there is a little bit of saw timber stocking that isn't present in the other shelter wood treatments. And then finally, the category of exploitive harvesting. And there's a caveat here, which I'll get to in a minute, but this is how these were characterized back in 1950, and there were three treatments. The first is called a guiding diameter limit, and that actually has been published um, out of the central hardwoods from a project that Tom, who's on our call today, was involved in, also for southern pines as a compromise between diameter limit cutting and more complicated selection. Here, it is a cut from above, but is constrained to growth. So you're never taking more that grew and you can leave some large trees for seed or wind protection and you can capture mortality. So from an experimental standpoint, that was our prescription, but it was kind of like, well, we know people are gonna cut from above. Can we do it in a way that doesn't degrade the stand? And that's the guiding diameter limit with the picture shown on the top right. We also had a fixed diameter limit, took everything merchantable over certain size classes. And then what we call a commercial clear cut used to be called an unregulated harvest, a logger's choice, which is now out of fashion because we don't want to be criticizing loggers. It's not necessarily their fault. So here's where we cut everything that was merchantable. And you see the stand condition resulting from that on the bottom right of the screen. 
we look at the size distribution, the guiding diameter limit retained a fair amount of saw timber, not a huge change in size structure from when the study started. Fixed diameter limit increased the saplings and commercial clear cutting increased the saplings and the poles. What were the compositional outcomes of these? Because composition is also one of the factors that relates to the carbon sequestration potential of any managed stand. Well, here we see in the selection stands, if you compare the composition in year zero across our three variants, so this was cutting on a five-year cycle, a 10-year cycle, and a 20-year cycle. So here it is in year zero, and here it is in year 60. And in short, there really wasn't a huge difference there. We see that there's a small proportion of hardwoods remaining. We did increase some eastern hemlock in some of these stands because of the repeated light cuts, and we did decrease some fir, which we were trying to do. But overall, these stands don't look super different from when they did when we started back in 1950. What about the even aged management? Well, overall, we found that shelter woods, regardless of variant, decreased the hemlock in these stands. Hemlock did not compete well with the spruce and fir once the stands were opened up. Where hardwoods had been left as residuals, the hardwood composition of the stand increased. That's kind of logical. If we look at the stands that did not have pre-commercial thinning, and in this forest type, we often use pre-commercial thinning not just to accelerate the growth of the submergible trees, but to shift composition by favoring the spruce over the fir. When we didn't do that, we had more fir. And lastly, where we did do pre-commercial thinning, we had an increase in the proportion of spruce. And here spruce is that sort of tacky colored green on the bottom of the graph. And in fact, this is the one treatment that increased spruce more than any other treatment that we had out there. And that was because an early intervention gave the spruce an advantage over fir, which would normally outcompete it. And then finally, what were categorized as the exploitive treatment. So the guiding diameter limit, which I mentioned, a compromise between diameter limit and selection. And here we see that we increased hemlock and we mostly maintained other species. Fixed diameter limit increased the fir, which is shown in the light blue, and decreased the spruce. So from a sustainable forest management perspective, in these conifer-dominated stands, that was not a favorable outcome. And then finally, the commercial clear cut where we just cut everything that we could, we did that twice, that increased the proportion of fir and hardwoods and eliminated spruce and hemlock. All right, so I just have two more slides to wrap up what we did and what the effect was before Josh interprets these outcomes from a carbon sequestration perspective. One of the questions that we have is, okay, I liked the compositional outcome of this treatment versus that treatment. Is that practical? Is it something that can be done? These are data from our colleagues, Mindy Crandall, who's now at Oregon State University and Maren Grandstrom of the University of Maine. And when you total up the harvest value from each treatment over the 65 year period, and this is expressed in 2017 dollars per acre so this accounts for inflation but it does not um they aren't discounted so we just summed up the values we see that we earned on average somewhere is between eight to nine hundred and fifteen hundred dollars per acre in these various treatments and if you look at the volume removed to achieve those values we see the pattern matches up pretty well. And that's because in their analysis, there were two things happening. One is that for most of our pulpwood products, there isn't um, a premium for quality. And in addition, they didn't have grade data. And so any of the stands that were growing really good saw timber trees didn't get the extra boost in value that you would expect. So, all right. We know how much we harvested over the study period to earn that. What if we divide it by the number of harvests? And here the results look a little different. 
So for instance, in the five year selection stand, we went in and we harvested some trees every five years. So 12 times so far since 1950. And so the volume per harvest, and this is in cords per acre, averages two to three cords per acre at every entry. When we look at some of the other treatments, we see that we're just about hitting that magic number of 10 cords per acre that we often throw around to say, that's what you have to have to have a commercially operable harvest. They're close to that. And so as we move on to talk about the carbon sequestration implications of this, one of the things I think we wanna keep in mind is the feasibility of the treatment and what other factors might have to come into play if we're recommending a treatment for carbon sequestration that might not currently be generating volumes that we would expect from an operability standpoint. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation and Josh is gonna step in. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, the carbon sequestration um, on the Penobscot Experimental Forest. And I'm gonna start out with, um, let's see, uh, my core ideas. And I wanna see if I can, yeah, so here are the, the core ideas that, um, and the key messages that I'd like to get across. So scenarios with uh, selection cutting, uh, they sequestered more carbon um, than those with shelter wood cutting followed by thinning or diameter limit cutting. Also, uh, strategies that maintain overstory stocking levels uh, necessary to generate uh, desired species and that promoted uh, the development of sawlog sized trees, enhanced uh, long term uh, carbon sequestration. So, I want to run through uh, some of the methods. Um, this study um, is uh, about the above ground uh, portions of live trees and uh, dead wood as well as harvested wood products. Um, and then we uh, computed uh, carbon stocks using 65 years of uh, empirical data on the PEF. So that's a real strength of our study. And then uh, when necessary, we simulated um, tree growth and mortality um, and then computed uh, the carbon stocks uh, with those simulations. Uh, carbon and deadwood was modeled with uh, records of tree mortality uh, and decay rate functions. And then in a similar way, uh, carbon in wood products and in landfills was uh, also calculated with those records of tree mortality and residence time equations. Uh, so those equations were by Smith et al. Uh, from the Forest Service. Stock change, uh, we used a stock change approach uh, to calculate the average annual uh, net change in carbon stocks uh, for uh, time periods between inventories. And then for each permanent uh, plot, um, the average annual change in carbon or AAC was derived by summing the net changes in the carbon stocks uh, for each inventory and dividing that sum by the total time span um, of measurements uh, for the rotation or 100 years. So AAC, that was the metric we used to uh, test for differences in carbon sequestration uh, among the different uh, forest management scenarios. And then finally, uh, the cumulative sum of net changes in carbon stocks, uh, we used these to uh, visually uh, show trends in uh, carbon accumulation or loss over time. And then Laura touched on uh, initial uh, conditions uh, on the PEF. Uh, so before uh, forest management treatments were initiated in the 1950s, uh, the overall uh, mean carbon stock uh, in uh, the above ground portions of live trees was uh, 66.2 uh, megagrams per hectare. And it ranged from about 60 to 75 megagrams uh, per hectare. So um, one megagram of carbon per hectare is uh, equal to uh, 0.446 US tons per acre. Uh, so if you think in uh, tons per acre, you can reduce these values uh, by about half. Uh, 
The key message here, though, is that uh, these, these starting conditions, they were relatively similar across the PEF, um, and there was sufficient stocking of desired uh, species to implement uh, those uh, treatments that Laura mentioned uh, across the PEF. Also, uh, when we compare carbon sequestration among different forest management scenarios, uh, these starting conditions are going to influence our comparisons uh, among those scenarios. So that's really important uh, to keep in mind. So on a rotation basis, um, all scenarios, they resulted in uh, positive values for average annual uh, net change in carbon. Uh, this is shown in table three of our um, paper in uh, carbon management. And um, I'll go over um, what, these, uh, what these names for these treatments mean. So on the left here, we have a single tree selection on a five and a 20 year cutting cycle and uniform uh, shelter wood with three stage overstory removal followed by no management. So those three scenarios on the left there, uh, they sequestered more carbon than the scenarios on the right side of your screen. And those were um, the guiding uh, diameter limit cutting, uh, uniform shelter wood with three stage overstory removal, followed by uh, PCT and commercial thinning, and um, uniform shelter wood with two stage overstory removal, followed by commercial thinning, and then uh, finally uh, fixed diameter limit cutting. <clears throat> And these values uh, that I show alongside the scenarios, um, these are the percent change or the percent decrease from uh, average carbon sequestered um, in the unmanaged uh, natural area. So for instance, uh, selection cutting on a 20 year cycle um, sequestered uh, a similar amount of carbon uh, as, as the natural area. So here's an example of um, carbon accumulation or loss over time, and this involves uh, selection cutting on a 20-year cycle. Um, in combined pools, carbon sequestration was um, positive for the entire study period. Um, you can also see why it's important to uh, account for changes in carbon uh, across pools. Um, you know, you may have a uh, decrease in carbon sequestration for the live tree pool, but um, you know that's kind of captured in uh, products and uh, the deadwood pools. So I want to I want to spend some time uh, talking about um, these these so-called winners or losers from a from a carbon perspective. So I'll start with uh, selection cutting. So um, while this met uh, carbon objectives, uh, the high proportion of eastern hemlock um, is a concern of ours due to um, the expansion of hemlock woolly adelgid. So perhaps uh, irregular shelterwood methods, um, they have a similar structure compared with the selection stands. Um, they could meet both uh, carbon and uh, forest resiliency objectives. So while <clears throat> they're not um, part of that long-term study. Um, I think there's room to uh, study carbon dynamics uh, uh, with the irregular shelterwood methods. And then here's um, <clears throat> our other so-called uh, winner. Um, this was the uniform shelterwood uh, with three-stage uh, overstory removal followed by no management. So while this might be a great way to sequester carbon, uh, your management options are really limited in these stands over time. Also, we know that um, during the uh, stem exclusion stage of stand development, um, wildlife species diversity is low. Um, and with this scenario, um, that stage of stand development uh, is quite a long time period. So those uh, three, let's see, the selection, um, 
the selection scenarios and uh, the, the shelter wood with uh, three stage overstory removal with no management after. They sequestered more carbon uh, than some of these other scenarios I'll talk about. So um, this uh, shelter wood followed by um, pre-commercial thinning and uh, commercial thinning. It did not sequester as much carbon, um, but I think that different uh, timing and intensities of uh, thinning should be investigated. Uh, here I show a photo from um, the commercial thinning network in Maine. And here, um, you know, we see a early commercial thinning, 50% uh, uh, volume removal uh, from the stand. In our scenarios, um, we also looked at a early commercial thinning, but with 40% volume removal. So um, I would hypothesize that a conventional thinning with uh, less volume removal um, in spruce and fir might uh, meet carbon objectives uh, better. So that commercial thinning network in Maine, um, that may be a, a good opportunity to look at, um, you know, what's the best way to sequester carbon <clears throat> at different timings and um, in intensities of volume uh, removal. So I talked about how uh, starting conditions are really important. Um, we have a lot of conditions uh, like this across the Maine landscape where uh, silvicultural rehabilitation uh, could be used to enhance carbon sequestration. Um, Laura and I have worked a lot um, on the PF um, looking at uh, silvicultural uh, rehabilitation uh, strategies that have been implemented, um, but we haven't looked at uh, the carbon dynamics um, that result from silvicultural rehabilitation. So this is another area where um, you know, uh, there could be some really good studies uh, about carbon dynamics. <clears throat> so now I want to I want to talk about um, what we've learned on the PEF um, in terms of carbon sequestration and how might we apply this on on the main landscape. Um, I really go back to thinking about those core ideas of stand structure. Um, maintaining large trees and stands, and then uh, thinking about regeneration outcomes. Um, I also uh, think about this in terms of uh, not only carbon objectives, but forest resiliency and um, adaptation to future change. So this could be climate change, uh, changing disturbance regimes, and uh, changes in global markets. So, um, this summer, when formulating uh, prescriptions for uh, stands that I worked in in northern Maine, um, kind of uh, thought about a lot of these different elements. So these were uh, mixed wood stands uh, composed of uh, large hemlocks. Um, they also included scattered maples, ash, and spruces. And there was a younger cohort um, of aspen and birch as well. And this was done on uh, the, the main adaptive silviculture network. And we focused on uh, cutting aspens and um, of merchantable size, and then retaining yellow birch, uh, maples, and spruces as seed sources. Um, we particularly wanted the option to regenerate um, yellow birch uh, in the next cutting. And then we retained uh, ash, uh, even though here in northern Maine, um, you know, that species may be at risk due to the emerald ash borer. Um, we retained some of those trees. Also, a uh, large eastern hemlock um, to meet um, the objectives of carbon storage, but also providing wildlife habitat. And I also show some uh, portions of uh, these stands uh, that um, include um, trees in the smaller uh, size classes. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, yellow birch, um, uh, paper birch, um, and you know I think this size class uh, these trees will uh, grow quickly and uh, they'll be sequestering carbon as well. So they were a pretty diverse stand that I think uh, uh, meets a lot of objectives. And then finally, um, 
<laughs> Lloyd asked me to uh, highlight some work that uh, I and uh, Ivan Fernandez and Jay Watson are working on. Um, we're trying to put together a paper on uh, the presence of non-native earthworms in uh, northern Maine. Um, so we've uh, detected these on uh, two of three of the uh, mason installations uh, where I work. Um, we're looking at um, soil carbon dynamics on these installations, but we discovered, um, yeah, earthworms at uh, two of these installations. So here I compare um, carbon stocks um, on sites without and with earthworms. Um, so these invasive earthworms, they're going to uh, really have a, a rapid and dramatic impact on uh, carbon storage. Um, in these forests, at least that's what we think. So um, uh, minimizing uh, new introductions of earthworms is gonna be important here in the state of Maine as, as we move forward. Um, Laura, Ivan, and I, we've we published a lot of results on uh, soil carbon um, on the Penobsc Penobscot Experimental Forest as well. Um, you know, about half of uh, the carbon in the forest is stored in the soil. And uh, with these O horizons, um, you know, some of the data I show here, uh, the O horizon, um, you know, is a pretty substantial carbon pool, um, about uh, 25 megagrams of carbon on the Penobscot Experimental Forest. Um, so with that, um, I guess Laura and I will both take questions. Um, 